Thanks very much. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for coming bright and early for the session on first part of this first session on the biology of uh, MDS. My task is to talk about the genetic basis of MDS. We'll have another talk tomorrow morning by Amy Desern that emphasizes the clinical impact of what we've learned about genetics. Here I'm really going to emphasize um, biology. Uh, I have a short amount of time allocated, so I really want to focus on a couple of key principles that I think we all have to keep in mind in this, in this area. Uh, let's see, sorry. Okay, let's see, there we go. So a couple of disclosures here, neither of which are gonna be at all relevant to what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna start here with a statement, uh, the, the following statement, mild dysplastic syndromes are colonial hematopoietic disorders characterized by et cetera, et cetera. I'm starting here because a phrase like this or some variation on it appears in virtually every paper written on MDS, often the first sentence of the paper. And I've cited one example at random here, but literally thousands of papers begin this way. And in the context of what we learned about genetics, I just wanted to kind of drill down, drill down on this a little bit. It's repeated so often that it's become dogma almost, but really what, what is the evidence? First of all, what do we really mean by clonal hematopoiesis? So I think that's dis depicted in the slide like this, where um, in the bone marrow uh, we begin on the left in a, in a state where we have populations of cells that have distinct genetic histories unrelated to each other. And then in individuals with clonal hematopoiesis, one cell, the green one in this example, is, is cloned. It's captured and copied and expands into a population of cells, the ones in yellow here, that have a related genetic uh, history. Of course, the cells in our marrow are not color-coded like this, so how do you how do, you, how do you recognize this and identify it? You, uh, the best way is to use genetic markers. Those are the little dots shown in each of these cells that give you a signature that can discriminate cells that are related to each other in their genetic history or unrelated. For example, a cytogenetic abnormality like deletion 5Q present in 20 out of 20 metaphases in a sample indicates that, that that's a clonal population of cells. They have a shared lineage. But most patients with MDS don't have an informative cytogenetic marker like that. So how do we really know that MDS is always clonal if we don't have a cytogenetic marker? So really whole genome sequencing provided for the first time a tool that allowed us to find an informative genetic signature to identify these clonal populations on 100% of patients with MDS because we can sequence the genome and identify all, all mutations that are required. And an, <clears throat> an example of this is shown here. So you see in this patient, when they were diagnosed with MDS, a cloud of hundreds of mutations colored in yellow here. They're all traveling together in a population. And then on the left, a smaller population in blue that was acquired later when the pa patient progressed to, to secondary AML. And so the, the interpretation of this uh, is that, again, those yellow mutations are traveling together. There's, there's a population of cells, and every cell has all of those mutations and then it moves on to form the, the other cluster. So an interpretation to prove that really requires looking at single cells uh, and really proving that those mutations really are traveling together. And when you do that, you see uh, the predicted result. And here's uh, one example from the same case that I showed you a minute ago. So these are single cells now in rows. So there are four uh, cells from either the bone marrow or the blood of this patient. And you can see that they're representative of the two clonal populations I identified on the previous slide. Two cells on the bottom that have all of the yellow mutations, those first ancestral or founding clone mutations, and they're all present, all traveling together, just as we predicted. And then you see two cells that have the yellow mutations, but now they have those blue mutations that appeared later. And again, it's all or none. You, you either have those subclonal blue mutations or you lack them. And if you have them, you're carrying along the yellow mutations that are part of this ancestral, the first clonal population that emerged. So using this kind of information, uh, to, uh, whole genome sequencing, to assess the percent of the bone marrow that's clonal in patients with MDS, we see that uh, all patients uh, have highly clonal bone marrows, even uh, at early stage disease, with myeloblast counts of, of even zero. Uh, and it's really when these patients progress to secondary AML, indistinguishable. They're just as clonal at AML 
as they were at MDS, 80, 85 percent of the bone marrow on, on average part of the malignant clone. And this important dividing line that we use, 20 percent myeloblast to differentiate MDS from AML, of course, important clinically, but you can see that there's really no relationship at all between the percentage of the myeloblast we see in the bone marrow and the percentage of clonal cells. So the, we've known for many years that the myeloblast count underestimates the size of the clonal population. Uh, and then this can be summarized in a figure like this again, which really just summarizes what I've told you. Uh, patients, patients diagnosed with MDS, at that stage, the bone marrow is already highly clonal. A single cell at some point was copied, cloned, and carried forward with all these mutations. And then typically, subclones emerge, again, by cloning a single cell, acquiring additional mutations and moving forward. All right, so I've talked about mutations already. I haven't said anything about genes, um, in part because from this whole genome sequencing information, 99% of the mutations that we see are not, even, not in genes. Uh, and about 1% of the genome encodes genes. And that's, of course, the focus of most of the attention because we understand those mutations and their consequences much better than the vast majority of, of mutations that are present across the genome. So focusing now on genes, uh, the next point to make is that MDS, like really all other adult human cancers, are characterized by enormous heterogeneity. Many, many genes that can be mutated. You can't read them, but here are a couple of Histograms from some recent papers, large number of genes were currently mutated in patients with MDS, and many combinatorial possibilities of mutations occurring together. So many, many different genetic paths uh, arising uh, that evolve uh, and can initiate MDS. Somewhere around uh, 40 or so genes now that we recognize that are currently mutated in MDS. But again, like certainly other myeloid malignancies, uh, other human malignancies in general, a relatively small number that are frequently mutated, say at 10 percent or more, about four or five of those. Those are the big spikes on the left. And another cluster of another four or five genes uh, mutated in about five to 10 percent of patients. But the longest tail here, uh, and we don't really know how far this goes, but at least another 25 genes that are likely important for MDS because we see them again and again mutated, but at a very low frequency. When you uh, take those genes down, shown in, in rows here, and collapse them into biological pathways in a heat map like this, you've probably seen patients now in, in, in columns, this illustrates, again, the heterogeneity. There's essentially no two patients on this plot that have the same pattern of co-occurring mutations. And again, you see this, this is typical in, in AML and NPNs, all hemolinguses and cancer in general. But there are, there are themes, there are stories. Again, collapsing them into pathways, we see pathways that, were, that we recognize from other myeloid malignancies, abnormalities in cytokine signaling, chromatin, cohesin factors. But really what I've highlighted here, the really striking outlying signal for MDS is this high frequency of mutations uh, in core components of the RNA splicing machinery shown at the top. So these splicing factor mutations are the most common pathway that we recognize now altered in, in MDS. More than half of patients, more than 60 percent of patients or so, will have a mutation in an RNA splicing factor. And they tend to occur early, not always, but frequently, again, in that initial ancestral or founding clone. So I'm not going to get into excruciating details here, but um, just to highlight a couple important features. These three genes, E2AF1, SRSF2, SF3B1 are the three um, major players of RNA splicing factors that are mutated, and they have some interesting properties. The mutations are always heterozygous, mutually exclusive, so if you acquire one, you don't acquire a second one of these in the same cell. And you can see from these figures the mutations are not scattered randomly. They, for these three genes, highly enriched, clustered in, in so-called hotspots uh, of these genes. So just to summarize what I've said so far about uh, genetics of MDS and, and incorporating here other things that I haven't said but you know uh, about MDS and AML, we can compare and contrast uh, where things stand today in terms of the genetic landscape of these two diseases, both at the level of chromosome cytogenetics and, and gene mutations. And these are, I think, the, the lessons that have emerged at the level of cytogenetics. We know, we've known for many years, MDS is typically characterized by unbalanced 
chromosomal abnormalities, loss of material from chromosomes 5, 7, gain of, of chromosome 8. These are the most common ones. Also seen in the AML, but much less frequently. And conversely, balanced uh, rearrangements, A21, version 16, uh, 1517, T33, are much more common in AML than, than in MDS. And again, looking at individual gene mutations, many similarities, but we have examples of genes enriched more common in AML. Transcription factors really in cytokine signaling, especially FLIP3 uh, is the most frequently mutated gene in AML, relatively uncommon in, in MDS. Uh, and conversely, now we have this massive enrichment in mutations and splicing factors, also seen in AML, but at a lower frequency. Okay, so uh, I'm going to move on really to the next theme. Um, I have two more topics that I want to try to cover briefly in the remaining time. The first is this. We're going to hear a talk uh, by Dr. O later on in, in the context of NPN and the importance of inherited variants and the interaction between somatic and inherited variants. There's a growing appreciation that these inherited variants are also playing a role in the initiation of MDS. So we've known for many years uh, about bone marrow failure syndromes, like Fanconi and dyskeratosis, that potently uh, increase the risk of developing MDS. And then came a few Mendelian disorders, first RUNX1, that don't have the stigmata of bone marrow failure, but again, high uh, penetrance for AML and MDS and then GATA2, and now uh, up to 40 genes that we now recognize play some role in the predisposition to, to MDS uh, and AML as well. So I'm saying this really just, again, to make sure that it's on people's radar screen. This happens. Here's a family that I studied where there are five cases of MDS or AML and first-degree relatives. This is not something that happens by chance. There's a genetic explanation here. Um, and uh, I want to end this section just by emphasizing some features that should raise your antenna, your index of suspicion that perhaps there's a role for an inherited predisposition to MDS. This is taken from a review that Lucy Godley published this year. So here are some things that should really get your antenna up. So you send a tumor sample uh, for sequencing and it comes back with mutation, a mutation in one of the genes that we know can be mutated either in the germline or somatically. And if you sequence a tumor sample alone, of course, you can't discriminate between those two. So if you're suspicious, you would have to sequence DNA that's obtained from some other constitutional source, like a skin fibroblast, for example. So the second scenario is your patient has MDS, and there's a second biological relative with either MDS AML or otherwise unexplained cytopenia. That, again, is enough to be unlikely to do to be due to chance and should consider referral to a genetic counselor and uh, perhaps germline testing. And then finally, your patient or a family member has stigmata uh, suggesting a, an underlying bone marrow failure syndrome, uh, which again can be cryptic until adulthood. All right, so in the last uh, minute, uh, I wanted to uh, cover really an important observation that's um, been published by a number of groups in the last few years that really is a bit of a cautionary tale for us, I think. So that is, um, if you sequence the blood of healthy older individuals, you will very often find mutations in genes. Uh, most often, genes that we recognize as key drivers of leukemia. Okay, these are healthy folks, normal blood counts, frequent mutations in these leukemia driver genes. Folks who harbor these alleles are at increased risk of later developing a malignancy, a heme malignancy. But importantly, uh, this is increased relative risk, right? The absolute risk is still low even with the mutation. Most of these individuals will never develop a hemolignancy, but they're at increased risk. And this is common, okay? About 10% of healthy 70-year-olds, normal blood counts, uh, will have this entity which has been coined CHIP or ARCH, uh, clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential, and, and you see the age-related features uh, with a steeply rising curve as folks get uh, above the age of 70. Putting it back in the model that I showed you early, again, uh, we have normal polyclonal hematopoiesis here. The idea is that acquisition, particularly of one of these genes, is sufficient to expand a clone. So this would be the, the, the situation of clonal hematopoiesis. Again, not sufficient. Not all of these people will progress to MDS and AML. Most of them will not. 
presumably because they require just the random acquisition of additional mutations to establish an MDS clone and later an AML clone. But on the last slide here, I just want to emphasize the importance for this entity. Why am I talking about it here? Okay, so MDS requires cytopenias, as you all know. Okay, so the fact that we can detect mutations uh, if the individual does not have cytopenias, that's clearly not diagnostic of MDS. In fact, most patients evaluated for cytopenias wind up not having MDS. They have something else or uh, unexplained cytopenias. I, and I'm explaining some of the jargon that you'll, you'll recall from the, from the quiz in, uh, in the beginning. So hopefully we'll do better uh, on the quiz and not, uh, hopefully I'm not confusing here. Um, so these individuals with unexplained cytopenias who don't have MDS are either CCUS, clonal hematopoiesis of undetermined significance, if they have a clonal mutation, or ICUS, if it's unexplained cytopenia, no mutation. The bottom line here is that the detection of mutations in the blood or bone marrow of an individual is not sufficient for a diagnosis of MDS. In fact, it doesn't even play a role even in our updated WHO uh, guidelines for the diagnosis of MDS. You'll see with one rare exception that I can talk about, MDS are not, uh, mutations are not really part at all of the diagnostic algorithm of MDS. Uh, and there's an important implication for monitoring patients, which uh, I'm running out of time here, so I can, I can get to if there are questions. But just to summarize, we've talked about this first point. Indeed, uh, MDS is a clonal disorder characterized by establishment of these founding clones and subclones, and there's enormous heterogeneity between patients. I wanted to highlight the importance and our growing awareness that germline predisposition may not be as rare as we were led to believe. And then there's this entity called CHIP, um, which muddies the water a little bit in terms of using mutations for diagnosis and uh, following patients on therapy. So I'll, I'll leave it there, and thank you very much for your attention.